You can't blame that on me. Now, um, in case you're wondering why we're here today, I, I noticed almost a thousand of you registered for this this quick webinar that I was doing. So there's a lot of interest in the stock market, and for good reason. Um, there's a lot of wealth that's built from investing. Uh, the people that tend to make the most money the easiest way uh, are the people who are taught investing at an early age. Um, I can tell you that your president elect or your inaugurated, recently inaugurated president, Donald Trump, uh, that he's teaching his children, he's teaching little Baron and little Ivanka and Vianca and little JJ, whatever these kids' names are, he's teaching them how to make money, just like your parents taught you how to make money or like you're teaching your kids how to make money, but He's teaching them in a way that is going to put them in the driver's seat. He's not teaching them how to make money in a way that is going to leave them victimized. Well, uh, luckily for you, um, I have this thing called a PhD in finance, and it gives me the ability to kind of understand at a microscopic DNA level how financial markets work, how wealth building works, how wealth accumulation works how all of that works. Um, and so my goal, my job is to talk to you about it so that you are uh, informed on this. So you can't say nobody told you. You can't say, well, I would have done things different if somebody had taught me different. Well, well, you're here now and now I'm going to teach you everything that your parents might not have taught you. Um, and uh, just kind of give you a taste of things because I know a lot of you um, haven't signed up for any of our classes in the Black Business School, and uh, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, the Black Business School was created to be a, a low-cost, high-quality alternative to an overpriced college education. Uh, college education leaves people in debt. Uh, we don't leave anybody in debt, but we have you walking away with a huge surplus in terms of the information you have, and we teach people how to build. Uh, we are big on building for the next generation. Uh, our physical location, which we, is, uh, is at Simmons College of Kentucky in HBCU, in Kentucky, uh, with, where we've recently opened the Dr. Boyce Watkins Economic Empowerment Institute. Uh, so that will be our physical location in case you ever want to uh, take a class there in a physical way. Uh, I'll keep you guys posted for when we actually launch things. We just made the agreement with Simmons College recently, and it's a great partnership because because I wasn't, I'm not a guy that's real big on, um, you know, traditional education per se. Um, I think that you're in the 21st century, not the 19th and not the 20th. Uh, the 21st century uh, landscape calls for 21st century learning. Um, I believe that you can learn a lot more at a much lower cost in a much more efficient way that's much more uh, precisely pointed toward what you specifically need as a black person. It's almost like developing med better medication. Right. You have the old school medication where they would they might make you better, but they might kill you at the same time because they're, they're killing the fly with a sledgehammer. But then over time, you get better medications. You get to where you get nano medicine and things like that, where they can precisely pinpoint exactly where the problem is so they can fix it. So for black people, uh, our medication, our economic medication, it cannot be broad based. It cannot be, you know, we live, you know, all tides or the tide will lift all boats. It can't be trickle down economics. It must be precise based specifically on what we've gone through, where we are, where we're trying to go, what we need to get there, et cetera. Uh, in fact, even with you, even when you to use the medical analogy, um, there are medications that work differently with black people than, they, than work with white people. Well, the same thing is true with economic medication. Uh, I hate saying this, and maybe I'm the first person to tell you this, and I don't know if I sound radical by saying this, but you ain't white. You ain't white. You, you're not white. Now, why do I need to tell you you ain't white? You're like, wait a minute, boy, you're an idiot. Like, you already know I'm not white. Well, the reason I have to tell you that you're not white is because you still believe in this sort of um, this illusion of America, uh, American inclusiveness. Not because America can't be inclusive, not because America can't be diverse, not because America can't get better, but because America's never really shown any real evidence to say that they're fully inclusive. Uh, you go to uh, that other university, you know, maybe the predominantly white school, which is fine, not, no, no judgment there, because I went to Ohio State, that's where I got my PhD. Um, and you go to class with other people who don't look like you, and y'all all graduate, and you've got better grades than them, and you all go apply for the same job, and you don't get the same job. Or if you get the job, you don't get the same pay. Or if you get the pay, you don't get the same promotional opportunities. Or if you get the promotional opportunities, you find that the sacrifice you have to make spiritually is so deep and so insidious and so painful that you don't even like looking at yourself when you wake up every morning. You get to about 35 years old and you wonder, what the hell did I just waste my time doing? Whose dream am I following? Whose, whose plan, whose vision was this? this? This wasn't mine. If I could have built my own vision, it wouldn't have been this. And that's what I went through. 
uh, I achieved the quote unquote black American dream. I tre- achieved the, the, the integration dream, the affirmative action dream, the assimilation dream. I was making, I got, I didn't get my first job till I was about 31 because it takes a long, it took me a long time to get my PhD. I was in school all through my twenties, but that first job made up for all the jobs I didn't get. I was making about $120,000 a year, something like that. Um, and you know, and, and that was pretty cool. You know, I could, be proud of what I was and what I'd accomplished, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't doing work that had any real meaning or real value. I wasn't helping my own people. I was dealing with a bunch of pricks. I worked with people that I didn't like. And I said, I got to get the hell up out of here. This ain't right. My spirit, I'd sit there, I'd sit up in Syracuse in my neighborhood, it wasn't nothing, wasn't no black people in my neighborhood. So I didn't have any friends. I'm all, I've always been a little bit of a loner, just, but it's good to be a little bit of a loner because then you think you, you come to your own perception of the world. It's not tainted by what other people have been led to believe. And I would sit there in my, in that apartment and I'd be thinking, man, this doesn't seem right. I'm successful, but I don't feel successful. I've made it, but I don't feel like I've made it. I'm supposed to be powerful, but I, I feel powerless. And that's what led me down the journey of thinking about the connection between wealth and power, um, how to get real power, what that looks like. Um, and so if you want to know what I was thinking about, for example, when Donald Trump was being inaugurated, is I said, man, that guy has a lot of power. That's interesting how he accumulated that power. I wonder how we can get some of that power too. So with that being said, let's let's jump in here and let's um, let's talk about some of this. Now, I want you to know that uh, I won't be able to answer a lot of your questions during the conversation. I'm gonna make a little bit of time for Q and A at the end, and also, you'll, if you you'd like, you can get a chance to um, try out our stock market class. You'll get a special offer at the end, uh, a huge discount if you're interested in giving it a try. Um, but this is gonna get you started on your investing journey, and uh, I'm gonna start by talking about uh, what I call my five dollar a day investment plan. So I, I, since I, since I came up with it, I, I named it after me. It's called the Dr. Boyce Watkins $5 a day wealth building plan. And, and, and I chalk it up to the magic of mathematics. You know, it's, it's fun to uh, use the magic of compound interest to really show people amazing things in terms of what you can actually accomplish. It's, it's almost like, it's almost like, have you ever seen somebody where, you know, you'll read, you'll hear a story about how somebody walked like from New York to LA Right. And you'll be like, how do you walk from New York to L.A.? That seems impossible. But people have done it. People have run that distance. <clears throat> and, and because all they did was they put one foot in front of the other. And even if they were walking slowly, mathematically, if they just keep walking, then eventually they'll get to the destination. Right. Well, you know, wealth building, wealth building is kind of the same way. It's, it's sort of mysterious in the sense that you're like, wait a minute. A person can only do that little every day and actually accumulate that much and actually get into the one percent or whatever by the time that they're done. Oh, well, let me show you. Let me, let's go through the math. Let's go through the slides here. First thing I want you to know is this. Did you know, this is something you may not know. This, you know, our, our, our beloved Barack Obama just left the White House. And I, I, love, I love him a lot. I, I just don't love politicians. I think that they, they all lie. But, but I like him as a person. I think he's great as a person. I love his family. He's a beautiful family. And, uh, and so Barack has left the office. And, and people, uh, some people love him. Some people don't. But one thing you have to give him credit for or some credit for, or at least say that this happened during his administration, is that during the time he was in the White House, the S&P 500, which is a measure measuring stick of 500 of the largest companies in America on the stock market went up 181% uh, during the time the Obamas were in office. So, so if you were a stock market investor, you, you're very happy with the Obama presidency because the stock market did really well. The Dow Jones Industrial Average went up 148%. The NASDAQ went up 284.5%. That's almost triple Triple. Have you ever heard somebody say something like, you know, we bought this house for um, 90000 and now it's worth, you know, 20 years later, it's worth two hundred and ten, and they're proud of that. They think that's really cool, right? So what's, you know, 90 to 210, that's not even two, that's not even a triple, right? That's about two and a half times the original value. And it sounds impressive, right? Even if it's over a 20, 30 year period. Well, over an eight year period, a person, the average NASDAQ investor saw their money almost triple. So that means if you put 10000 in the market, that 10000 turned into about $28,400, right, if you invested in the NASDAQ. So Obama and his administration, as all president administrations, uh, took very good care of people who invest, who like to invest in the stock market. This is going to continue to rise under Donald Trump based on you know all indicators I see. Why? Well, because presidents prioritize stock market performance in their agenda. If the stock market crashes, they get together that morning and have a meeting with economic advisors to say, what can we do to make the stock market improve, right? 
Now imagine if they did that with black with black American problems. Like what imagine if we lived in a world, see this is me fantasizing here, but imagine if they were to say, My guy, this year seven hundred and fifty people were murdered in the south side of Chicago. That's an, a national crisis. Let's have a meeting this morning to solve this problem. Can you imagine if they had meetings like that, how quickly they could clean up uh, the violence in Chicago, just like that? But they don't clean it up because they don't care, right? Well, when it comes to the stock market crash, when, when investors are losing money, they give the loss in the stock market A1 top tier priority, right? And so this is going to continue under Trump most likely. If it does drop, believe me, they're going to do everything they can to keep it from happening. That is a benefit to you if you're an investor. Uh, politicians may or may not help the working class, but they always take care of people who do these things. They take care of people who own property. They take care of people who own businesses. They take care of people who own stock. They also, the tax code is even structured to benefit those who do those things. They, they incentivize activity in the economy with taxation. If they want you to do something over here, they'll say, okay, well, we're going to give you a lower tax if you do this than if you do that. For example, in investing, uh, you, have a, you pay a lower tax if you invest long-term than if you invest short-term. That's because they don't want people to be short-term investors. Why? Well, because short-term investing uh, and day trading, a lot of day trading sort of makes the markets go up and down. It creates what they call volatility. So they don't want volatility. They want smooth, well-functioning markets that go up over time. So they incentivize you to be a long-term investor. Uh, what else? Um, they also want you to own a house. They wanted you to believe that owning a home was the American dream. So what did they do? Well, they said, well, we're going to let you write off the interest that you pay on your mortgage, right? We're going to give you special tax treatment on the mortgage. Well, they also want people, they want corporations and business owners to do well. So Reaganomics, they said, okay, we're going to create preferential tra tax treatment for people who own businesses, right? So they create the tax code to benefit certain people and get them to do certain things. So it, the, the tax code is designed to benefit those who own instead of rent. If you're a renter, you, you don't get tax breaks for renting. But if you're an owner, there's a whole lot of tax breaks. You get benefits for running companies instead of working for other people. You get tax benefits from producing rather than consuming products. You get tax benefits for lending as opposed to borrowing. You get tax benefits for investing rather than spending. So let's go down that list. You got owners who own owners, people who own land, who own companies, who produce products, who make loans, and who invest. And then you got the people who rent. Now I want you to think about where you were, which side of this fence you were raised on. Well, people who rent apartments instead of trying to own a home, people who uh, work for other people instead of starting a business, people who consume and, and line up, at, you know, getting those long lines of Black Friday to spend money as opposed to those producing products, those who borrow, who go deep in debt as opposed to actually loaning money to people who are going in debt, and those who spend rather than invest. Which category do you think that most of us are raised to be on? Most of us are raised to be on that right side than on the left side. Right. So a lot of times uh, where you end up economically is is determined by where you start. Now, let's go deeper. Now, let's look at this. Now, I'm going to show you this graph real quick. Uh, there is a point in this graph. This is the uh, the stock market performance over uh, the, the eight years that the President Obama was running for office and the time that he left up until well, up until 2014. It actually keeps going up if you include 2015 and 2016. But we only have 2014 because that shows you enough. And this is where Obama says that buying stocks is a potentially good deal. Think about that. He was having a press conference and he's, they're like, whoa, wait a minute. The stock market lost money, Mr. President. All the big money billionaires are blowing up your phone because they want to yell at you because the stock market is not performing. And we know you work for them. So we need you to do something. So he says, well, you know, buying stocks is a potentially good deal because the stock market has declined. So people start buying. The demand starts going up. Prices are going up and up and up and up and up. And that's pretty much uh, one of the mechanisms that drives market performance. Most people, now here's the problem that we have in our community. A lot of people have a fear of the stock market, deeply afraid of the market. Uh, they think you have to be rich to buy stock, which isn't true. Um, this is a $5 a day plan. If you can't afford $5 a day, then uh, then just uh, just go sit to the side. We're going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray for you because we, we feeling bad for you right now because, you know, I don't I, I hate for you to be in that position. So if you got if you can't do the $5 a day plan, we're going to have you start with the $1 a day plan or the $2 a day plan and work your way up. Or maybe you can get with some of your friends and pull your money together and, and, and do something, right? Now, Next, what else? They think you have to have a lot of education. That's because people who run the markets, who uh, who do all this stuff, 
are pretty much, um, what's the word, what am I looking for? They try to impress you because they're, they're sort of trying to get you to think that they're smarter than you. So they use a lot of fancy long words. I, I heard an investment advisor uh, telling, explaining how, how to build wealth to somebody. And I was at one, at an event, you know, I do a lot of events every year and stuff. And, and I was listening to this brother talk. Now, mind you, again, I'm a finance professor. So I know, I know, you know, I know this stuff pretty well. And I was listening to him talk and I said, my God, that poor lady, she's sitting there staring at him, pretending like she understands what he's saying. But I know she don't understand what he's saying because I can't halfway keep up with what he's saying. And I could tell what he was doing. He was using a bunch of words that he didn't fully understand because he wanted to impress her to make her think that he was smart. It reminded me of Damon. Anybody remember Damon Wayans on Living Color when the guy when he played the guy that was in prison that memorized the the source and memorized the dictionary and would use the long words? The apputination of the tampon goes into the subordination of the predicate, right? Remember that? Like, he was kind of like that. And a lot of investment advisors kind of do that. Like, they really will throw out crazy words to really confuse you. And it's also a way that they – it's a method that can be used to extract money from you because they make you think that they, they can see things they can't really see. Um, they think the market is corrupt. Well, there is a little bit of corruption in the stock market, but the U.S. markets are actually among the least corrupt in the world, and they actually have the Securities and Exchange Commission, which was put in place so that white people can't rob other white people. So if, they're, if they can't rob of each other, then they're probably not, they're not really going to be able to easily rob you. It's, it's, it's just not, I mean, I know you want to believe that, 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 that horrible things are going to happen every time black people try to do something. And I understand. I mean, you had Black Wall Street. You had all these other atrocities that have occurred. But I'm telling you, the coast is clear. You can come out now. You ain't got to be scared. Don't get me wrong. There's still stuff out there. There's stuff going on. I mean, we got Trump in the White House. Yes. However, there are lots of people, black people like you and I, regular working class people who have become multimillionaires. And the beautiful thing is that they move in silence. These, bill these millionaires move in silence. You don't even know that they have all this money because they're not being flashy. They're not showing, they're not trying to wear their money. They're not trying to drive their money. They're not trying to impress people that don't matter. They're driving little regular cars, wearing regular clothes, living in regular houses, living regular lives. And all they do is very basic stuff. They don't start business, they, they, excuse me, they don't go deep in debt when they go to college. They don't, they don't spend money to impress people. They start businesses, they save consistently, and they invest. Next thing you know, they're passing over a million bucks down to their kids. Uh, they think that a lot of people think the market is a great place to lose money. Why? Well, because you see all the ups and downs on the day-to-day -day market and it scares you. But actually, uh, Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time, explained it very clearly. He said, if you're not prepared to own a stock for at least 10 years, then you shouldn't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. So if you own stock long term, a lot of those ups and downs don't matter anymore. So anyway, let's move on. So here's some facts. Trillions of dollars in wealth are being created on the stock market. The rich are getting richer. The reason the rich are getting richer is mainly because they own stocks and own businesses. Uh, middle class people will buy homes. That's how they, they have the bulk of their wealth. If you're middle class, chances are a big chunk of your wealth is in your home, maybe in your retirement. If you want to be upper class, you got to just take step your game up a notch. You know, instead of owning one home, um, wealthy people find a way to buy two and three homes. Also, instead of just owning a house, they also put money into the stock market or they own businesses. Instead of working for people, they own companies. So that's how the rich get richer. That's what the middle, that's what the one percent does. Um, middle class people own homes, poor people own nothing, unfortunately. Uh, but, but there are ways to be an owner no matter who you are, no matter what your income level is. So what are some keys? Well, number one, there's a formula. There's kind of a way that wealth builders build wealth. Most regular people are never taught this. Uh, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. Uh, this doesn't just apply to people who, in who inherit lots of wealth. You see, a lot of times because we don't, we want to believe that we're powerless because we really want to believe that we have no choice. We want to believe that we're incapable of accomplishing anything. We love to find a hole in any solution that comes along, right? You know, I call them Negro naysayers, you know, people that find a problem for every solution. Like it's almost like they're playing defense against hope and prosperity and possibility, right? Like you say, well, you know, if we go that way, we can, no, uh, no, that ain't going to work. You go that way, no, that ain't going to work. They don't know. No, no, go that way. No, no, no. That Dr. Boy said every time you start a business, they just going to they just going to burn it down. So you don't, don't do nothing. I don't like that because what that's really saying to me, unfortunately, is that because you've been sort of trained to think a specific way, um, you don't really want me to explain how it's possible for you to do some of this for yourself because you use your hopelessness as an excuse for your laziness. When you don't believe something's doable, then you sort of, that excuses you to not even try, right? How many people do you know like that? People that are so hopeless that they don't even try.
right? And if you say, well, you know, uh, I know you broke, I know you struggling and everything, but you know, you had $200 and you could have saved that and you could have did this and did that instead. Or, you know, you could have got a job at, at the such and such. They, 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 they fight you every step of the way. They're like, well, no, I was sick that day. And, and I mean, my foot was hurting and I didn't want to go get, I mean, you go out in the cold. I'm not going to go out there, right? They, they'll find an excuse. You know, the Negro naysayer mentality is kind of like an addiction to what I would call struggle nomics. Struggle nomics to me is when you just are just so committed to the struggle, even even in the language. You know, people say, well, it's a struggle out here. It's hard out here. I don't really want to think about my life as a struggle. You know, I'd rather think of it as a struggle where I'm going to win that shit. Excuse my French. I cussed. I apologize. I, I want to think of life as like, you know what, it's going to be a battle, but I'm going to win because I come from the greatest group of people in the history of this world. We are the mothers and fathers of the earth. As Dr. Francis Cress Welsing said, we are the parents of, of the universe. So, so you can't stop me. You can't stop me. And that's what, that's when I tap into the God spirit. And I'm, I don't mean to get all crazy with y'all, but I'm dead serious. You know, like I just, in my mind, I think, well, no, 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 this is this struggle. So-called struggle is an opportunity for us to say we overcame, you know, they say we shall overcome. Well, we ain't even overcome yet. We, ain't, we have not overcome hardly anything. But when we do overcome, it, then we can start singing and say, look at what we built. And we did it with nothing. That, to me, is black power. That's black pride. So let's, let's keep going. All right. So, uh, you know, this, these, four, these rules also apply to, to self-made millionaires. Uh, these are the people I pay more attention to, not the people that were sort of given everything. I'm talking about people who started with very little and accumulated a lot over time. So here are the two of the biggest questions that many of us ask ourselves. There are two questions uh, that most of us at some point have to ask ourselves and the questions are this, how am I going to make some money, right? You know, you, one day you wake up and realize that you need, that money makes the world go round. You need money to do basic things. So your question is, well, how am I going to make some money, right? The second thing, uh, so, so here's how the unempowered person answers that question. This is, this goes back to when you were a little kid, when you got first introduced to money, when you asked your parents for some money for some jeans or to go skating or, you know, to go buy Pokemon or whatever it is you did when you were a kid. This is, this is how an unempowered person answers that question of how am I going to get some money? Uh, the unempowered person says, I'm just going to wait for the government to give me some money, right? I'm going to wait for the government to create opportunities for me. I'm going to wait for the government to send me a check. Whatever. That's unempowered. Doesn't mean you're lazy. Doesn't mean you're bad. It just means that you don't feel that you have the ability to kind of get it yourself. You kind of are waiting for somebody else to give it to you. But it's our government, too. So it's not like we don't deserve that money. It is what it is. The moderately empowered person says, I'm going to go get a job. So your parents might say, well, you want some money, boy, you better go get a job. Right. You might have parents like that. Uh, what else? A hardworking wealth builder takes it to the next level. They say, well, I don't want to go get a job. I want to create a job. I'm going to start a business. Right. That's what a, a hardworking wealth builder might say. Like, no, I'm not meant to be the, I, you know, me, I, for a while I, I was okay being the employee, but I didn't like it. I said, no, I don't think I want to be the employee. I think it's more fun to be the boss. So how do I be, how do I become the boss? How do I get his job? Right. Right. So, so then the, the person who does the least work though says, I'm going to make an investment. And that's deep. I, I had a conversation with Dr. Claude Anderson. Y'all know I love Dr. Anderson. He wrote the books, uh, two of the most important books in the history of all of black America, Black Labor, White Wealth, and Poweronomics. If your children haven't read these books, make your kids read these books, please. These, these should be required reading for every black family in America. And one thing Dr. Anderson said that was real, really cool. I loved what he said. He said, um, he was telling me, he said, well, you know, actually my Jewish friends, they don't really want to run a business because that's work. He said what they do is they will own 10% of 10 businesses, which gives you the same income as if you own the whole business, a whole business yourself. And they spend their time playing golf because they get money just by putting up the capital. Their money is working for them. That when you hear people say, let your money work for you, that's when you show up and somebody says, well, I want to build a bakery and I'm ready to do the work, but I just ain't got the money. You provide the money. So you're making money just by providing the money. They're doing actually the actual labor. Right. So there's different ways to make that money. And that's what I would say in hip hop terms. You know, you remember that song, making money the fly away. Well, that's the fly way to make money, in my opinion. All right. Anyway, let me keep going. The truth is that at the end of the day, all four solutions work. And that's the mixture you seek. Right. If you look at wealth building historically in America, wealth has come from some government subsidies. Right. So. So, yeah, we can go and march and rally and tell the tell President Trump or President Wilson, President Johnson, President Smith, whoever the presidents are in the future, President Kanye. Right. Whoever the presidents are, 
we can tell the president, yeah, we want our portion, we want our reparations, we want some land, we want our home state act, we want all of that. But then also, uh, when you when your children are taught how to make money, you teach them how to work hard, just as if they're working for someone, but the person they're working for can be themselves, it can be you, it can be someone in their community. It does not have to be a white man. And then it, it, eventually you graduate to the point where you build a capital base and you can reinvest that capital base in order to make yourself more wealthy. So how do we catch up with rich folks? Well, um, a lot of this comes down to understanding what other people are doing and that you're and what that you're not doing, right? So we have to sort of readdress how we even talk about money from the very beginning. You have to let go of the idea, this idea that they have some magical voodoo, right? Stop thinking that they somehow have access to some a bunch of things that you'll never have access to. Don't get me wrong. Donald Trump has access to things I don't have. He has access to wealthy friends that I don't have. Absolutely. But there's a lot of stuff I have access to. I mean, remember, I, I think I've, I've shown you guys before, and I'll, I'll tell you again, that the, the black people have more spending power than the gross domestic product of most countries on this earth. I mean, I could go down the list from Saudi Arabia to Sweden to Venezuela to Egypt to Nigeria. Like, there are entire countries that don't have as much money as black America has. But the thing about money is that um, what happens with money depends on what you can do with it. You know, you have um, people – okay, I see a lot of hands raised. Let me, You guys, let me know. I'm going to take a quick little break. I'm going to ask you, can you – uh, hear me. If you can still hear me and everything, go to the Q&A box and say, yes, I can hear you or something like that. So I know you can hear me. Let me see. Okay. Kim Williams says yes. All right. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Is Kim the only one that can hear me? Okay. Well, I see James Brown and William Williams. Okay. Great, great, great. All right. So let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. All right. So, 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 you know, because the thing is, it's very easy to kind of look at people that are doing something at a certain level and really attribute it all to magic. It's not magic. It's not magic. It's very basic, and it's stuff that you've known your whole life. I just, I just help you understand it a little bit better because I just, you know, as a professor, I should be able to do that, right? Stop believing that they're all liars and crooks uh, and, and, and that they just have wealthy sugar daddies, that there's somebody just gave them everything. Um, I had none of that. You know, when I was 28 years old, um, I was homeless, te technically. If homeless means you have nowhere to live and you got to leave your apartment in the middle of the night because you can't pay the rent, then that was me. You know, I, I had to fill up my whole, I, I had enough money to rent a one-way van to Ohio because I had a place where I thought I could stay in Ohio, in Ohio and I had to fill that whole van up with everything I owned and leave in the middle of the night. It was, it was not cool. That, that, that's, that's not, that's not fly. That's not, you know, so no, I, I probably couldn't even get a girlfriend or anything when you live it in your van, but, uh, and it ain't even your van, but, um, you know, uh, so, so I know, you know, that feeling of being empty in the bank account. But, you know, at the same time, even when I had no money, I was always a billionaire uh, because of the knowledge I was accumulating. You know, when you kind of know how to build things, um, you know how to take things that, that don't have much structure to them and create what you want. It's like if I gave you, uh, a, you know, a million acres of land um, and you knew nothing about what to do with that land, you might think that's a waste. You, I could literally put you on that land and you could starve to death and be bored to death and have no income because you don't know what to do with that land. But imagine if you had a million acres of land and, you, and the people you put on that land were carpenters and gardeners and hunters and builders and computer technicians and people who could build an electrical grid and who knew plumbing. They could make that land into a complete city, right? If you had enough skill, you could literally build wealth with the skill you have. So for black folks, you know, we must uh, commit to excellence such that we, uh, as a part of our consistent cultural norm, uh, push for the idea of all of us being wealthy in terms of skill, right? It's very, very important. So let me keep going. All right. So uh, that's why I, even when I was broke, I knew I was wealthy because I had education. Uh, and I also, and then when I eventually got some heart and I got I had courage to go with the education, a little vision to go with that and a little maturity to go with that and a little experience to go with that, then I knew I couldn't be stopped. Uh, so, so moving on. So, so there's some steps to the wealth building process. First, you want to find out where the money's at, Right. Two, you learn the system so you can decide where you want to be in the system. Three, you make a plan for getting access to wealth over a long period of time. That's your wealth accumulation process. This is a wealth building life cycle that I created. This ain't nothing that you that you might you might see something similar in somebody's book somewhere, I guess. But this is something I literally put together just for you guys. I didn't read it somewhere. 
Uh, next, you implement a long term. So, so sorry. After you you learn the system and learn where you want to be, you then make a plan. After you make the plan, you implement the plan. The implementation is a long-term process of accumulation of wealth over a long period of time. Most people don't get rich quickly. They get rich slowly. Next, you must protect the wealth you've accumulated. A lot of people don't know. You ever heard people say, more money, more problems? Yeah, you probably heard that, right? Well, that's really true, right? Uh, when people get money and, and get it, accumulating money is no longer your problem. Your big problem at that point is protecting your money because when you get a lot of money, Everybody wants to borrow some. Everybody wants to steal it from you. Everybody wants to, to sue you for it, right? Uh, you know, just like it, it's very basic. I mean, this is an animalistic concept, right? Um, you know, the way animals kill each other in the woods to take their take their food, take their woman, take whatever, their, their territory. Well, you run through the, you roll through the hood shining in a Mercedes with 25 gold chains around your neck with your music blasting and your pretty girl next to you because you two chains and you, you're on top of the world. What's going to happen to you? You're going to get beat up and robbed like two chains got beat up and robbed. Well, the same thing is true with rich people. If you are, if, if everybody knows how much you got, then you're going to get beat up and robbed, except you may not get beaten physically. You just get beat up in court or somebody beat you up in, in the court of public opinion or, or whatever. But you know, or if you're an athlete and you got a lot of money, and you don't have any education, then your manager and your lawyer and your accountant, they beat you up and rob you. Right? So at the end of the day, uh, you want to protect the wealth that you've accumulated. I don't know if you know this, but 70% of all wealthy families lose all their wealth within one generation, 70%. 90% lose all their wealth within two generations. So as you accumulate wealth, start thinking about how you're going to protect it. So also stop believing that wealth can only come to those, those who have money. Um, Albert Einstein said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. This is the guy who created E, e equals MC squared. He understood uh, mysteries of the universe that no other physicist in the history of the world or mathematician had, had ever understood uh, in many until this day. And he said compound interest is, it, it absolutely fascinates him. Two things fascinated Einstein from what I've read. One was compound interest. The other, other one was quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics, if you know anything about it, is very, very weird. If you want to ever just see a weird horror show, go watch a video about quantum mechanics. It'll freak you out. Uh, so anyway, so what does that mean when he says compound interest is the greatest force in the universe? Well, um, he, it means that money just grows really fast. You know, money m multiplies in ways that, it, that is absolutely mind boggling. Um, you know, if you look here, here's a, here's a chart I want you to look at. This is compound interest. It, let's say you had $1,000 in principal and you let it grow. You just put your $1,000 in there and you can see, you can kind of see it at the bottom. I'm sorry, guys. It looks like a, the bottom's kind of chopped off a little bit, but you can see it goes out 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 years. So you see that, that how it grows. At first it grows uh, slowly and then it starts growing a little more and a little more and a little more. And so the interest is what you earn off the principal. The principal is what you put in the first thousand. That doesn't change. The interest is what you're earning from the principal, but the compound interest is interest on top of interest. So it's almost like I compare it to like bunny rabbits, you know, like I, I you know, when we were talking about in, a, in class, in our investing class, I said, if you're trying to have, let's say your goal was to own as many rabbits as you possibly could, right? How would you accumulate a stockpile of rabbits? If they were $10 a piece, would you just go and buy 10 rabbits this week and then 10 more next week and 10 more the next week and just keep accumulating? And then if you want to own 5,000, just buy 500 rabbits for $10 a piece. Or sorry, if you got $5,000, you can own 500 rabbits at $10 a piece. No, you don't do that. If you're smart, what you do is you buy five male rabbits and five female rabbits. You put, on, you put them in a pen, you turn on some Marvin Gaye, and you let nature take its course. You let the rabbits create other rabbits. And then next thing you know, you got rabbits on top of rabbits, and then the rabbits that are born are, are getting together with other rabbits and making more rabbits. Next thing you know, you've got a 1,000 rabbits when you only started off with 10. Well, money grows like bunny rabbits. So in a way, the, the, the corny way I describe it, I, I talk about it as, as money rabbits, right? Money rabbits, money rabbits. Yeah, it's funny, right? So anyway, so let's keep going. All right, so let's talk about uh, you know, how money grows. Now, here's the thing. Annuities are better than one lump sum of money, right? That $1,000 that we just showed you does grow in compound interest. Well, what if you were putting in $1,000 a year or $1,000 a month, right? And you have this same process occurring, except it's occurring hundreds of times because over, over many, many years, you're just doing that every single month. Well, that's what an annuity is. An annuity is when you're putting the same amount of money in every single time, just your $5 a day, choo, choo, choo. 
choop, just doing it over and over and over again. So let me show you. Uh, what's an annuity? An annuity is when you're not putting one lump of money in, you're putting the same amount of money in every period for a certain number of periods. It could be monthly, it could be daily, it could be minute by minute, it could be year by year, whatever you choose. This allows both your principal and interest to kind of grow together. So you're getting, you're, you put in your money, the money earns interest, the interest earns more interest, but then you're putting in more money, which is earning more interest, which is earning more compound interest. So it really accelerates the process, right? So, so what happens is you create power. This creates financial power. So what I did was I said, okay, I'm going to really, you know, I, I had a real hard time you know, really in the beginning when I'm trying to convince black people that we can actually do something with, that we can actually build something because there's so many people that really believe that we're just broken. That's where we're supposed to be forever. And it bothers me very much. So I sat around thinking about creative ways to help people understand how anybody, historically anyway, how anybody could build wealth if that's what they choose to do. So I created the $5 a day investment plan, $5 a day. That's less than you can't go to Starbucks and get, if you get one item, you might spend less than $5. If you get two items, you can forget it. You, you get, you get a, a water and a banana. You're going to spend more than $5. You get a coffee and a muffin. You're going to spend about seven, eight, nine dollars or whatever. So the $5 a day investment plan, less than the cost that it takes to go to Starbucks or even to go to McDonald's and order off the, the dollar menu or whatever, or you can't even buy that much gas for $5. Right. So let's say that you uh, earn ten dollars an hour. Uh, most of y'all make more than that. But those of you who make only ten dollars an hour, you can even get with this plan as well. Uh, you work 40 hours a week. Well, what is that? That's 80 dollars a day. You're earning four hundred dollars a week, sixteen hundred dollars a month. Just so you can see it, you know, in your head. Um, now, let's assume that the five dollars a day is almost like lunch money. Right. So you can get an app. And I show my students exactly how to do this in, in the investing class. Uh, you can get an Acorn Stash or Robin Hood or something like that and just do $5 a day in what they call the auto stash. Uh, that's what stash has. And the question is, how much money would you have after 10 years? So remember, you're broke. You ain't got nothing. You are flat broke. You're like me when I was in my van moving in the middle of the night with my basketball on the dashboard because I had all my stuff in the back of the van. You ain't got nothing. So you're not, you're not starting from anything. How much money would you have after 10 years? Well, after 10 years, uh, if, you, if you don't save at all, you'll have nothing to show for. So imagine if you just save that money instead of investing it. Let's start with savings first so you can have a benchmark. So a lot, because a lot of people talk about savings. So let's, let's look at this. Okay, so if you, you started poor, uh, and you'll finish poor. That's what some people believe. That's what you're taught in America, that if you're born poor, there's nothing you can do about it. You're kind of trained to be hopeless and helpless. So I'm flying through this slide real quick because I want to get to the next one because the next one's far more interesting than this. Uh, if you simply save and don't invest, uh, you'll be okay. So $5 a day adds up. That's what my grandmother used to do. My grandmother used to save. That's all she did. She didn't invest anything because she didn't want to lose her money. Uh, so you save your money. So you have $150 in a month, approximately. It's about 30, assuming a 30-day month, which approximately is about $1,800 a year, which over a decade is about $18,000. Over 20 years, it's 36000 And over 30 years, that's 54000 So that's not bad, right? I mean, you save 30 years, $5 a day, you got fifty-four k. You're not poor, right? You're no longer in poverty. I mean, you're not balling, but you're not, you know, you're not destitute, right? So, so saving isn't a horrible way uh, to build money. But, but, but here's the thing. So saving can give you financial security and an insulator from poverty, but it doesn't actually give you a chance to move up. We want to do the George and Wheezy. We want to move on up. We don't want to sit still. So let's talk about how you, how you can move on up. But so the problem with saving is that your money doesn't grow. So this keeps you from enjoying the benefits of living in a, in a money and capital driven society. You see, when you live in a society where there's investment everywhere and businesses are starting everywhere and people are looking for capital everywhere, when you're sitting on that 54000 that you saved up, you shouldn't just be sitting there. That's like having the nicest car in the world in your garage and you're not even driving it. You're not, you're not driving it. Nobody can rent it. Nobody can get in it because you don't want to get the seats dirty, right? Uh, well, you don't want it. You don't want anybody to wreck your car, right? Well, you know, that's a problem because, you know, a lot of people don't invest because they're afraid. Um, and there's ways to overcome all of that. And we talk about that specifically, uh, in, you know, with my students. And, and I can tell you more about that later if you ever want to know. But, uh, but let's, get, let's focus on this now. So a lot of this fear is totally unfounded. There are complete theories I can show you that will say that if you allow fear to keep you out of the stock market to this point, you missed out on a lot of opportunity for no good reason. So I'm not crazy. I'm a professor. So let me explain. Let me dig a little deeper. All right. So imagine if you invested that $5 a day 
instead of sitting on it. Let's say that instead of saving it, you actually took it and you said, let, let me let this money work for me. And let's assume you earn 9% per year on your investments in what they call a diversified portfolio, which means basically that you don't put all your eggs in one basket. 9% a year is a reasonable assumption based on what the market has done up until this point. Uh, how much would you have after 10 years? Well, remember before you had 18,000 after 10 years, I think there was, uh, yeah, that's right, 18,000. And now look at what you have after 10 years. So we have three uh, levels here. We have no savings. This is what happens when you go spend your money on Gucci belts and sneakers and t-shirts and, and uh, you know, and trying to be fly. So you're down here at the zero mark. You, 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 you're just over broke. You got to keep working because you have no backup plan. Uh, you're playing struggle nomics right here. Now, if you're a saver, you're smart. You're smart, but you're, you're a wimp. So you're not, your money hasn't actually grown, but you've been accumulating. So good for you. That's good. So after about 10 years, you have 18,000. If you invest according to this model, this is how much you have. So the investor has done, this is what's true throughout history. Now, past performance does not predict future performance, but this is what would have happened, you know, pretty much over almost any 10 year period in American history, right? The investor would do better than the person who simply saved. Okay. So let's keep going. Uh, wealth after 20 years. Let's go out to 20 years. Let's see here. Let's look at the chart. So 20 years. Now you see that the uh, at the 20 year mark, uh, the saver has accumulated uh, about 36,000, but the investor has over 102,000. So I'm going to put these charts next to each other so you can see how the gap grows. Now let's go 30 years. The saver has accumulated 54,000, but the investor has about $281,000. $281,000. I don't know about you. But given that this person started off working for $10 an hour and committed to save investing $5 a day, there's no way on earth this person who has $281,000 in liquid financial assets could call themselves poor anymore. <clears throat> in fact, they couldn't, they weren't poor after the first, after the 10 year mark, they weren't poor here, but here they're actually doing well. They're probably in the top 5% of Americans. I don't know what the wealth level is to be in the top 5%, but they're probably pretty damn close. So let's look at this chart. Now, this is what I would call out of poverty. Now, um, this says category four. That's a little bit of a typo, but don't worry about that. So after 10 years, you can see the gap is here, but it's, the wealth levels aren't that high, but the gap is still there. 20 years, the gap grows. Wealth levels get higher. 30 years. Now, look at 40 years. Look at this. What if you did that 40 years? What if you went out 40 years and you did the same strategy? This number is over $700,000. Now, 40 years is a long time. That's, you know, that's about the average working life of a 25-year-old, right? So that, but that means that person would be able to leave uh, three quarters of a million dollars to their family. Uh, it means if you had a child and you started a $5 a day investment plan for your newborn baby, by the time your child was 40, based on history, your child would have hundreds of thousands of dollars in assets to play with. They, they, when your child 40 years from now is competing with Baron Trump, Donald Trump's son, who he's preparing his son to be a boss. He's not preparing his son to be anybody's employee. He's preparing his son probably to be an arrogant prick just like him. And uh, when, you know, the question is whether or not your child can stand up to Baron Trump 40 years from now will all be determined by what, how we set the playing field for him. Did we lay out a foundation for him or did we leave him hanging out to dry? Dr. Claude Anderson said that it's, a, it's criminal to send your child to somebody who hates him to go beg for a job because he can't pay his own bills and can't feed his own family. It's criminal. So it's absolutely criminal, in my opinion, for you not to invest for your child and for you not to teach your child how to compete in a competitive economic society. Black people were never taught how to compete. It ain't your fault. If you go read Black Labor, White Wealth, one of Dr. Anderson's books, he's, he quotes laws put in place that said that our goal for black people is to make them into a reliable, hardworking, well-disciplined, uncompetitive subordinated labor force so you're if you're not competitive it ain't your fault you were trained to be that way but it's time for that jig to be up it's time to end that right now so uh so here this this shows you how you can compete even if you're starting off uh, at the bottom so here's what uh, i want you to observe number one the differences between saving and investing they grow at what you call a non-linear rate. That means that as the more time goes by, the more the gap increases. So it becomes that much more pronounced, that much more dramatic, the longer you invest it. When you are an investor, your number one asset ain't money. Your number one asset's not money. Your number one asset is time. A person with no money and a lot of time is better off than a person with a lot of money and, and no time. Period. So if you're listening, you're in your 20s, you are better off than a millionaire in their 50s. That is a mathematical fact. 
The question is, what are you going to do with this precious commodity called time? Are you going to waste it or are you going to invest it? If you are sitting around spending, feeling sorry for yourself, then you're wasting it. If you're hustling and making moves and making things happen, getting knowledge, investing and putting things together, building your portfolio, then you're investing that time properly. You will end the game ahead. Uh, next, a person who starts poor doesn't have to remain that way. I don't care what anybody tells you. I just showed you mathematically that a person who has a low income makes a little above minimum wage with some discipline can actually build something. Uh, a poor person who wants their child to be well off has a clear pathway to get their child out of poverty. So if you can't get yourself out, if you can't do right by you, do right by your babies anyway, please. My goodness. So it's not magic, it's math. That's all it is, it's basic math. And if it's math that confuses you a little bit or boggles you or kind of makes you question and a wonder about it don't feel bad because albert einstein felt the same way it boggled him it made him think this can't be right this there's no way money can grow this fast <clears throat> so anyway <clears throat> i'm going to end this with like a quick special offer if you want to dig deeper into this and you want to learn more as you know we have the 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 dr boyce watkins stock market investing program uh which you can sign up for it's a class that uh, goes on and on forever. It's a program. So you can treat it like a class, which means you can stay for a few weeks and then go, or you could just stay and we meet every week. We meet twice a week. And all we do is we talk about wealth building. We talk about stock market investing. We do lectures on every single thing you can imagine for, that, that involves stock market investing. Every question you have, we answer it, et cetera, et cetera. We have lectures on everything from day trading to just simple buy and hold strategies. And I can mentor you through that process. Uh, it's a very, very low cost program and, and it's very effective. Everybody loves it. If you know anybody who's in the program, just ask them, do you like the class? I guarantee you they're going to say that they love it. And if they don't love it, then you shouldn't sign up. But, but everybody loves the class. Um, if you want to sign up, you can visit, write this URL down. You can go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com. That's the blackstockmarketprogram.com because I made this for black people. I like using the word black because I get tired of people being scared of being black and being afraid to say the word black or, or pretending like blackness should always be an afterthought. I don't think blackness should be an afterthought. Blackness should be the preliminary thought. I can't see anything without seeing it through the lens of blackness and I choose to be that way because that's what we need. My energy is best applied when it's directed to the community. I'm not trying to apply it to everybody and, and let black people kind of tag along. So you can go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com and sign up. <clears throat> now, the uh, code word you can use is uh, Webinar 120. Webinar 120, that's the date, January 20th. So you use the code word Webinar 120, that's one word, and the price uh, drops by 40%. So the monthly fee, the regular monthly fee, is $89 a month. Uh, if you sign up with the discount code, you can get in for $53.40 per month. And that's that's good for the next 48 hours. Okay, so you can sign up at a discount. That's your price both now and forever. Also, uh, all content is recorded. So everything we've done so far, you can access all of that. All the special lectures, you can access that. Um, I threw in a free, co a free digital copy of our new film, The Secrets of Black Financial Intelligence. You can watch that for free as part of the program. So we pretty much give you everything you need to have pretty much whatever you would get in any sort of finance program at any major university, including Harvard or Yale. There's nothing you would learn at Harvard or Yale that you can't learn right here. We know all of that. I know all of that stuff. I've been teaching for 23 years. I've taught probably about 20 different finance classes at major universities. Uh, also, the program lasts for as long as you're a member. So there's no deadline. There's no date where I'm going to put everybody out. But you can always leave whenever you want to. You can unsubscribe whenever you like. Uh, but you can also stay in there forever. And as long as you're a member, the discount applies. And there's a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee in case you're not happy for any reason. We have a whole support team that you can reach out to that can help you with that if you ever have any issues. But nobody has issues ever. Everybody loves the class, and I think you're going to like it, too. All right, so let me uh, end the screen share real quick, and I'm going to answer some of your questions. Uh, so that's theblackstockmarketprogram.com. All right, so let me see. I'm going to grab the Q&A section again. Let me see. All right, so we're going to do rapid-fire Q&A, and I'm going to answer as many questions as possible. Try to make your questions quick because it makes it easier for me to answer them because when the questions are um, really, really long, like my grandma just inherited, you know, two million dollars and she owns a farm and and gets disability and is trying to figure out if it's going to mess up her Social Security after she figures out how to quit her job and get, invest her 401k rollover. Like like I can't do all of that right now. Um, but, you know, if you can give me one sentence, that would be awesome. All right. So let's see here. Uh, Derek says, have you ever done binary options? Have I done them? Uh, no. Uh, have we talked about it in class? Not yet. Do I understand them? Absolutely. I know exactly what binary options are. So we can do special lectures on binary options. Um, Jay's in North Dakota. Wow. I bet you're really cold right now. North Dakota is like the coldest place ever. 
Um, let's see. Kirk says, what do you think of Punch TV's IPO offer? I don't think anything about it. I mean, it's an IPO. Um, there's something called uh, the efficient markets hypothesis, which pretty much says that investors are going to bid the price that should be bid for that, um, for that, you know, for that security. So it's not like sort of some magic thing that, that punch TV is some great company that, you know, that's going to be different from everything else. Um, it's, it's kind of like every, every other IPO. So uh, assuming that it's a, you know, on a major exchange, if it's like some private stuff where you saw your boy on Instagram was selling the shares and you might want to be really careful because those that maybe you might actually be participating in an illegal IPO, but I don't know much about punch TV. Um, how do you know which stocks to invest in? Uh, well, that's actually something that's not as hard as you think. Uh, a lot of people think that it is um, that it is um, complicated to pick stocks. It's really not. Um, I point you guys to uh, the book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton Malkio. And in that book, he does an experiment where he has monkeys pick stocks. And basically, the monkeys actually make more money than the experts from Wall Street. And the reason is because monkeys don't make it complicated. Monkeys just would pick the stock and go eat bananas or whatever and let the stocks grow. Uh, and basically he showed that if you just diversify, you're usually going to be in a good, in good shape. What you don't want to do is not diversify. Somebody was asking, is the code webinar 120? Yes, it is webinar 120. Uh, and the URL is the, the black stock market program.com. So it's the black stock market program.com. Uh, anonymous viewer, can you do a video on life insurance? Well, in the stock market class, I can certainly do a video on the types of life insurance that link to investing. Uh, absolutely. Just uh, I, you have a Q&A section in the course. And so you can request special lectures and what you'd like to what you'd like for us to cover in class. We'll, we'll we can cover everything. There's already a ton of stuff in there. But uh, by the time, you know, the, the next six months are up, I'm going to have tons of stuff in there. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, let's see. Evander says, Evander, it makes you think about Evander Holyfield. Uh, appreciate all you do. I currently invest in Apple, Microsoft, sharebuilder.com. Are you familiar with this platform? If not, do you recommend? Um, oh, with shell sharebuilder.com. I don't know much about sharebuilder.com. I can look it up. If you're in the class, just ask me about it in class again, and I can investigate it. Uh, we've reviewed three apps, Robinhood, Acorn, and Stash. I'm going to view, review um, some other stuff. I think one's called Betterment, and there's maybe Wealthfront. I think Wealthfront is one of the apps, or maybe that's something else. But I, I'm going to review it. Somebody asked me about it. So I pretty much review whatever the students want me to look at. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, Gabrielle says, I was trying to get the previous recorded courses for the investing class. Okay, if you have any challenge logging in, um, just email, write this email down. It's support at theblackbusinessschool.com. That's support at theblackbusinessschool.com. We have a very good, very big, well-paid support team that's available to pretty much um, kiss your toes and be at your beck and call. So whatever you need, and if they don't kiss your toes and you tell me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kick them in the butt. Um, anonymous viewer, what are the penalties when you withdraw funds from mutual funds? There are no penalties to withdraw from mutual funds. There are penalties to withdraw from retirement plans uh, where you have to pay um, taxes, number one. Then you have to pay a penalty for early withdrawal of about maybe 10%. Um, let's see. I finished a temporary job last month and therefore back on the job search trail. I will start my business once I raise enough money. This year, I would like to raise a seven-year investment fund. What would you suggest? Um, oh, oh, start a seven-year investment fund. Um, you know, I, if you're asking about suggestions in terms of what you should buy, um, the main things I would say is just make sure you diversify and make sure you keep it as liquid as you need to keep it. Um, you know, so for example, a liquid investment is like a stock because you can you can buy stocks pretty easily. Um, a an illiquid investment is like art. Art is hard to sell. Uh, stocks are very easy to sell. So uh, keep it liquid, um, keep it diversified, and keep it consistent. Remember that time is more, literally more valuable than money in investing. Your number one asset is not money. It's actually time. So don't, don't forget that. So use your time to your benefit. Don't waste time. When you waste time, you really are wasting an unbelievable amount of money. Um, let's see here. Okay, somebody's asking, can I see the first slide again? Um, um, well, I don't want to go back to the first slide right now. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll make this uh, video available. I'll put it on my YouTube channel um, and you can you can get it off of there. If you're in the class, uh, it, I'll, I'll load this into the class as well. Um, and let's see here. Uh, Lakiva says, what about kids? Um, 
okay, if you like kids, you should have them. If you don't like kids, don't have kids. I, I'm kidding. I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean when you say, oh, what about kids? Um, I like kids. I, I, have, I have a daughter and, and my son. Um, let's see, Denise, if you were t- just starting to invest in stocks with $1,000, can you give me step-by-step directions on what you should do? Um, well, we do get, we go through the step-by-steps of buying your first share of stock in the class. It would be hard to go through all that now, but the apps you might want to look at are Acorns. Uh, we, 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 in, in class, we, we teach the students how to use Acorns, Stash, and, uh, Robinhood, uh, for starters, because those are the apps that, um, have different uh, approaches based on the types of investing that you're going to do. And so, um, you know, another way is you can open up an account with like a Meritrade or E-Trade or something like that, uh, that, that can get you there. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, Richard, uh, hello, Dr. Watkins. My name is Richard tuning in from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, I actually listed you as someone I'd like to meet in a recent article I was interviewed for. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, So this is pretty cool. (laughs) My question is, do you think credit repair business is a profitable business to look into? Yeah. A lot of people need credit repair. Just make sure you learn, learn the landscape, learn what you're, learn what you're doing so you can really know how to make the business work. Um, Don't just go into it because people are making money in that industry. Um, Go into it after you do some research and investigation, you may even want to hire like a mentor that can actually help you build the business in the right way. Uh, let's see, let's keep it going here. Okay. It's so funny. I see a lot of yeses from early when I asked if you couldn't hear me. Okay. let's see. Uh, Willis, uh, Dr. Watkins, can you explain low turnover mutual funds and whether it's a good investment for those who want to retire early, live off dividend income? Um, well, low turnover mutual funds are basically mutual funds where they don't buy and buy and sell a lot of shares. There's not a lot of churning, like a lot of like selling this and buying this, selling this and buying that. Because whenever they're buying and selling, that's transactions cost, which reduces the amount of money that you actually make. So uh, there's a, a, an argument that says that you know you don't need to do all that. You know they have what they call exchange traded funds, ETFs that allow you to get the benefits of a low turnover mutual fund without paying the fees of a mutual fund because mutual funds charge you for all the overhead. They, they charge you for the, the staff, the research, the buildings, the administrative fees, the secretary, all of that. And you know, some people say, well, ETFs don't do all that. They just track an index. So it might be easier to do, but just because it's low turnover doesn't mean it, it pays a dividend income. So uh, that would be a very different kind of, um, of investment vehicle. Um, Let's see here. Uh, Gar- Garveyism says, so I just about have enough right now to start investing in the stash app. My question is, do I just pick a diversified portfolio and do the auto stash? Well, that's a good way to get started. Um, they, they, what they do is there are different ways you invest based on your risk tolerance. Um, there are different ways to invest based on your time horizon, how young or how old you are. Young people invest very different from uh, old people. Um, there, there are also categories of assets you invest in different sectors so you might invest some one person might want to go into tech another person might want to go into fashion another person might want to go into environmentally clean or green energy companies or whatever right so or clean energy not green energy but you know what i mean uh so 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 investing is a lot like um like picking clothes you know it's like style you know um maybe you like jeans and i like something else corduroy or something does anybody wear corduroy anymore or did i I just sound really old when i said that anyway all right, so let's see. Um, Willis says, I once heard the golden rule of fi- a personal finances always have 70% of your net worth in investments, meaning that you should always have no more than the remaining 25% in depreciating assets. What's your opinion on the statement? I think it's a good rule. I think it works. I mean, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules. Uh, but then again, though, you know, I'm not a guy that follows rules. I'm a guy that believes in doing things that make sense. And so um, that the benefit of that is that as the world is changing, um, you can reshape your paradigm and your approach based on the existing opportunities um, that, that are out there, right? Um, so you, you can't live in 2017 with a 1992 mindset. That's not going to work. It's just not going to work for you. Um, let's see here. Mark says, how do you feel about investing in REITs, real estate investment trust? Sure. That's, that's great. Um, you know, the big rule about investing is you, you diversify, spread your money out. So um, a lot of times when you say, what do you think about investing in gold? I'll be like, okay, sure. If you say, what do you think of, well, boys, what do you think about investing in tech? I'll say, okay, okay, sure. Uh, boys, what do you think about investing in China? Well, oh, okay, sounds good. Sure. Right. What am I saying? Where am I getting that? I'm getting at the idea that you want to just diversify. You want to have you know, seeds planted everywhere um, because you can't really predict exactly which industry is going to do what exactly. I mean, anything that you can predict based on information you can look up in a magazine, 
millions of other people have that same information. And so what happens is the price changes based on the information. So let's say, for example, there's information in, uh, in Time Magazine that says um, that General Electric is going to make an extra $10 billion a year next year. And you say, oh, my God, I just read that GE is going to be making all this money. I'm going to go buy some GE stock. Well, by the time you go back and buy it, the price will have already changed to reflect that information. Investors would have already pushed the price up. So you're paying more for that company because it's a more valuable company because of this information that's been released. That's what they call the efficient markets hypothesis, which leads to what they call the random walk theory in finance. I'm not going to talk much about the efficient markets hypothesis or the random walk because that would confuse you and scare you. And my goal is not to scare you. My goal is to guide you in a way that's going to make sense. So um, anyway, I, I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. Uh, the URL is the black stock market program.com the black stock market program.com the password is webinar 120 webinar 120 use webinar 120 one word not two and you can get in for 40% um, off and that's a special offer that lasts for 48 hours and it's because you came out here and we hung out today and I hope that I've given you something that benefits you um, in your journey I you know I just really want to see you invest I want to see you build I want to see you do something good with your money so um, you know uh, you can't now you can't say nobody told you because I just told you all right guys I'm out of here and I love you and I hope you have an awesome day and have a, have a great weekend don't be nerdy like me sitting around working go do something fun I'll talk to you guys soon take care bye bye